Thanks, Tim. Um, thanks for inviting me to join in for this conversation. I just want to set the record straight. I have not done groundbreaking research in the field of time. Um, she's um, lying. She's, <laughs> she's, she, she knows think, things that none of us do. I think it might be because I, I recently wrote something for the Rubin about time, um, and I really enjoyed researching and summarizing that. I actually work on a different part of the brain, which is very close to the region that um, controls circadian rhythm. And um, I'm sure that will, will come out later. But because I am the scientist, I wanted to uh, start with a couple of experiments and very rigorous experiments. Um, so the first one would just to be ask you to take a moment and think about nostalgia and what you think of nostalgia and whether you think it is a good or useful thing or, or not. Um, and then at the end, we can re revisit the idea that you have of it at the moment. And my second experiment is to put Shazad on the spot and illustrate something interesting about memory and how we construct memory um, and to say, what is your account of when we first met? Oh, okay. I think this might sort of hit on what Tim was suggesting, that actually knowing each other, you might get a bit more out of us. Um, I remember us first meeting, was it in, in the East Village? Lower East Side. Lower East Side, okay. Close. <laughs> um, I'm already on shaky ground, um, but um, I, was, I was with Mark Bartlett, who's a, an academic friend of mine who writes a lot about film, um, film and contemporary art, and you, you came to join us with our mutual friend, the artist Agnieszka Courant, and I can't even remember what the cuisine was that we were eating. Was it Japanese or Korean? No? It was, uh, I think, Malaysian. Okay. <laughs> um, any other cultural faux pas I can commit tonight? <laughs> um, well, uh, I think so. Who knows, right? Who knows? It's true. That could be... Okay, you're relying on But me. you're the scientist, so I'm sort of d deferring, aren't okay. I? Which is, uh, which is also interesting as a reveal. Uh. Um, but I remember us... I don't remember actually what we talked about, but I okay. remember us hitting it off straight away and getting into one. Okay. Um, which I think we've done many times since. I think whenever we, you, you might be in for a treat, everyone, because most of our conversations last for a minimum of three hours. We'll try and condense, <laughs> give you some highlights. But does that, does that vaguely fit with the contours of your memory? No. So, um, <laughs> I, Ag Aga was already at the supper and she sent me a text to say, come. And I came with another friend, Dawn. And I don't remember your friend, Mark, at all. Oh, and I don't remember your friend, Dawn, exactly, at all. Exactly, right? <laughs> and um, I was tired and not expecting a stranger to be there. And I am not the most gracious person when it comes to meeting strangers. And I remember you very sort of politely, like, well, so what do you do? And I said... I'm a neuroscientist, and I was like, oh, well, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, well, I'm mapping the neural circuitry that underlies appetite. Um, oh, so you're interested in food? No, not really in food, more like I'm interested in behaviour and how neurons control behaviour, and food just happens to be a really good readout for that because you can tell, you know, when a mouse is eating as opposed to when it's maybe, you know, feeling a bit depressed or, uh, uh, you know, existential. <laughs> and you said, oh, so you're, you, you know you're interested in behaviour? And I was like, well, not really. <laughs> I'm a biophysicist and um, I record from neurons and basically I read these papers during my undergrad that were done in the 50s and they sort of illustrate really quite beautifully and perfectly that, that neurons... Um, obey this law of physics called Ohm's law and I just think this is so amazing that I, I love spending my days recording from neurons and this happens to be within the framework of trying to understand how, 
what makes us want to eat. And you're like, so you want to understand desire using physics? And I was like, yes. And she's like, so you want to you understand the most irrational thing using the most rational thing, basically equations. And at that moment, my mood, you know, you'd won me. I was just like, I had never been so absolutely summed up, pun intended, um, by, by this phrase, which you may or may not uttered now, but this is how I remember the thought well, process well, occurring sound, in I mean, my it head. It sounds very smart and incisive, so I'm going to claim it. Do it, do it. And then I remember you, 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 the conversation moved on, and I, I, I think you automatically assumed that I was, uh, you know, not into anything that was, didn't have some sort of explanation, some sort of anti-spirituality, anti-religion. Anti and, and at that moment, I felt quite defensive, and even though I don't have a religion... I felt the need to convey how absolutely awesome my job is because I get paid to look at life every day. Every day I have to notice and observe and record and the awe does not wane. I, every day I regard what I see in the same way as, as a child would. I haven't, I haven't lost that wonder. And science is not neat and not tidy. What you hear about it after the fact is, because that's when everything's all figured out. But when you're doing it, it's messy and dark and very, like, ex existential, I think. But um, I wanted to ask you, Shazad, then, so do you think nostalgia is a good or useful thing? Oh, it's, it's difficult because we've probably got a few hundred contrary opinions forming um, while I try and formulate an answer to that. And I would say that, you know, one of the things that really interests me in terms of this idea of nostalgia and time is how we think it at different stages along the sort of path from birth to death. So, you know, for me, I always had a very, very... Um, detached attitude to nostalgia, more sentimentality. In fact, I grouped them together, which I don't so much nowadays. But I think as a, as a younger man, I grouped nostalgia and sentimentality in the same sort of like, Egh. you know, I, it, they were just both things that slightly kind of, slightly re repulsed me. Like the, the quote? Yes. So, um, you know, one of my... A sort of mantra for me in my younger days um, is from Leonora Carrington, the, uh, the British surrealist writer and painter, um, whose writings were a huge influence on me as, uh, when I was at art school. And uh, there's a line in one of her stories which goes, <clears throat> sentimentality is a form of fatigue, said the happy corpse. And that very much <laughs> summed up my attitude. It was the perfect, you know, summing up of my attitude to nostalgia and sentimentality uh, for the longest time. And, you know, I suppose like with anything that the human mind starts to get too rigid about, contrary evidence starts to sort of permeate your life through the, through the sort of functioning of life itself. And I, I think that sort of call and response, you know what I mean? When we try and... It's that sort of ongoing journey to sort of understand the self while also sort of realising that the self is a, is a construct. And, and then sort of where, where in, in that sort of... You know, it's almost like this sort of contradiction between um, predestiny and free will. You know, where in these sort of two mechanisms constantly interlocking and working against each other do we situate this notion of what is the self? And then in relation to sort of time and memory... You know, I'm still very wary of nostalgia and sentimentality because I think they're kind of, they can sap energy or the will. Um, and that's another probably, I'm stepping into will, that's another big problematic kind of terrain to step into. Um, but I think I'm aware that they have a function and obviously a place in our sort of emotional toolkit. Well, it's interesting, two things that you've said in terms of 
the life stages and also um, you think it's a sap because I'm going to explain a little bit how that, that's not the case. But because you say life stages, um, I kind of want to bring it back to the, to the VR installation and the, the, the different lines of research you were conducting at different stages of your life and then the, the narratives that you constructed out, out of them, also, sort of, also the eeriness of the synchronicity of certain things that, that somehow sort of came together in, in, this, in this way regarding your interests at different time points in your life. So really, I mean, just to come back on that, um, the virtual reality work, Kalin Pong, that, that is upstairs on the fifth floor, and actually all the other work that I currently have in the museum is, is from the same investigation into Kalin Pong as a, as a site of collective memory. Um, and what's, I suppose what's quite interesting to think about an interest or a theme that you might pursue at different points is that I first came across Kalin Pong in the writings of Alexandre David Neal, the French explorer. As a, as a teenage boy, I was very um, infatuated with her writing. You know, she was like uh, this wonderful um, female Indiana Jones. You know, her, I, I don't know if many people here have read her writings, but you know, my 15-year-old imagination was, was, was full of the imaginings of her, her kind of accounts of um, her travels. You know, she famously uh, snuck across the border into Tibet dressed as, a, as, a, as an old beggar lady and was the first Westerner or Western woman to do so in 200 years, depending on which accounts you read. And, uh, you know, she, she, had a, she adopted a, a Tibetan son. She was caught up in all sorts of skirmishes between feudal warlords, between Tibet and China. And it was this, you know, and Kalim Pong I first came across in, in one of her books called Magic uh, and Mystery in Tibet. But how old were you then? I was about 15. Okay. Um, and she describes meeting the 13th Dalai Lama, the, the, the previous incarnation to our current one, uh, above um, Kalim Pong in 1912. So, you know, 1912, 15, you know, and, and I filed Kalimpong, um, as we do, you know, I'm quite interested in the idea of the memory <laughs> mansion, so I filed it in... in Even at 15? I was quite an odd 15-year-old. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. Um, I think I already had certain obsessive research tendencies then, and then Kalimpong sort of came back and sort of bit me on the butt in a totally, from a totally different direction and to be honest that is what tends to spark my interest when things um, when usually I, I sort of term it as as three unlikely synchronizing factors and that's what makes me interested to, to sort of engage in a project and I was in my mid-30s and I was researching Tom Slick who you know had the most amazing kind of uh, surname for a Texan oil millionaire um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he was quite a polymath in his day. Um, so, I mean, he was very active, 50s, 60s. He was friends with Howard Hughes and Jimmy Stewart. And, and, he uh, pays me, by the way. Sorry? Howard Hughes. He anyway, did what? Sorry? He, he pays me. Well, his, well, his funds pay me. Thank you, Howard. Uh, well, <laughs> I think I'll, we'll come back to that okay. in a moment. Um, but... Um, Tom Slick was also interested in cryptozoology. Actually, it hadn't been named at that stage. Cryptozoology, for those who don't know, is the search for sort of mythical, mythical beasts. Um, and I, I was particularly fascinated. He funded three expeditions in search of the Yeti in the mountain ranges above Kalimpong in the late 50s and early 60s. And, and that's where Kalimpong suddenly reappeared. And I was like, I know that place, and you know. So I went back to aisle C, drawer number forty-seven B, and yeah. and was and found my reference card for Alexandra David Neal, and and then it was like, you know, what's going on in this place called Kalimpong? If the, if these two quite kind of already quite rich and layered narratives are both sort of meeting there, what else is going on? And and that's really where the project took off for me. Um, but. So, because you've started the story now, can you, um, and you all really must go and have this experience. It's not the sort of thing I think I would have done unless, you know, a friend had, had created it. But 
having having had it, it's brought up so many other questions as a neuroscientist that I, I want to ask and will ask. But it's it's a really really um, magical experience. And can, maybe if you can talk about some of the other like reference points in in the journey, like the finger and other oh. things, like, things like that. Well, I think it's just. I mean, that's where. I suppose I'm sort of... Just I've become it's such a great story. It is a good story. But we, we should get back to the science in okay, a minute. Okay. And I'm, and I'm, I will, I will, I will. I'm, I'm curious about Howard Hughes. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's some quite amazing stories around, around Kalimpong, but, uh, but, but Tom Slick is one of the, the best sort of rabbit holes I went down in my research. And, you know, I, I always think there's something... And this is maybe where I've softened my position on nostalgia over time because also I start to see it as a sort of collective shared memory, rather than I'm less sort of bothered about my personal nostalgia. You know, I think I'm, I'm sure everyone here has been on an airplane or, or, or a dinner party where, where you get that very unfortunate thing happens and you're stuck next to a dreadful bore. You know, and it's the equivalent Or on stage. <laughs> No, 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 I'm always much more, much more careful about vetting who I'm on stage with. You'll be pleased to know. But, you know, you're stuck next to a dreadful bore and, they, and your evening is the equivalent of looking at their holiday snaps. You know, and you're just... And, and, and maybe that's, that's my continued distaste for nostalgia, where somebody actually thinks that the minutiae of their sort of, of their sort of egocentrism is kind of of interest to you. And, you know... And, you know... Depending on, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I've grown up in Asia and in Britain, but my Britishness, when it's in the ascendant, I'm sort of polite and could have somehow, you know, gird myself and sort of push on through the evening and, you know, <laughs> just with mild thoughts of suicide, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, it's one of the refreshing things, I think, about spending time in New York, because New Yorkers are so much more plain speaking. And when I feel, you know, my new, let's say my New York... Um, my New Yorker in the Ascendant, I'm able to say, oh, my God, you know, um, something very urgent's come up. Will you excuse me? One of my children's had to be admitted to hospital. And, you know. but, da but damn you, because you've already jumped ahead to where I wanted to go in terms of place, and you haven't even finished the story. But, OK, to give a little bit more science, apparently we tend to become nostalgic at very certain points in, in our life, and there are moments of transition. So... Um, during adolescence, when we're, we're becoming more adult and things are very uncertain, we, we tend to cling for security to um, fond memories of the past. And likewise, maybe we're, when you're becoming um, an older adult, from a, a less old adult, and you're thinking about the sort of commitments you want to make, you maybe become nostalgic about when you had less concerns, fewer concerns... And um, it's been shown that actually nostalgia in those moments, yes, it, it, it comforts us, but it also gives us hope for the future and allows us to create the future, sort of future that we, we want rather than just flailing. We, because we can remember, oh, life was once, you know, happy, secure, fulfilled, whatever, I, that will, can come again. Um, so it's 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 not so much a wallowing; it's more of a, a bolstering to to propel yourself um, into into the future. But then, when you talk about your New York self and your British self, I mean, this is something that I have to contend with, and something you mentioned to me ages ago about when you were in Pakistan and your partner at the time said, "Oh, you're a completely different person," and I'm kind of interested in. And the idea of nostalgia, not just related to time, but related to place, and the fact that you're not necessarily missing the past, you're just missing the person that you were at that time. Because I feel, especially with technology today, I'm leading many parallel lives, and there is my New York self, and then there is my London self, and there's my Edinburgh self, and there's my Paris self. And the, the places bring out different elements of you. So I just wondered 
if you could talk a little bit about that as well, how place informs the idea of who you are and how you've experienced that as fragmented and are there selves of you that you are nostalgic for even in, like, in the present? Can we hold that? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to hold that thought. Don't okay. worry. I'm, I'm going to come back and answer okay. it. But I wanted to come back to you and ask, both in terms of the sort of life stages as well as geographical shifts, how does that map out in terms of brain chemistry or brain physics? More, I mean, is there neuronal activity to kind of corroborate? Oh, uh, well, definitely during adolescence. I mean, everything is in flux a lot more. Like, that's why you know, supposedly adolescents are more risk-taking um, and lot, many conditions, their onset is, is around that then just because certain receptors, like the patterns of expression of receptors are, are coming, uh, are beginning to happen as, as also, you know, hormones are released. And so because everything is in flux, um, that... Uh, sort of mirrors what is happening probably in the outside world for the adolescent too. But then later on, I don't think so. I mean, I think definitely in the lab, one is able to induce a sense of nostalgia when you make people scared and miserable, <laughs> basically, as opposed to like happy and joyful. So then that there would be brain chemistry changes associated with that, right? And then that then nostalgia is used as a coping technique. But um, I, I don't know like what a brain on nostalgia looks like, you know. But I mean, that, I'm quite interested in that. And maybe that's where I've always had this sort of slightly wary relationship to nostalgia, where it becomes a sort of coping mechanism. And sort but of that propels you into the future. So it's positive. It's not it like... It does and it doesn't. You know what I mean? I kind of, just to come back to your idea of fragmentation, okay. um, you know, that's something I very much experienced, um, you know, most of my life until a certain point, I was uh, born in London um, of mixed Indian Pakistani heritage. And there was a sense very much in the 70s when I was growing up in London of, of being an immigrant being it, it's it, London was not the sort of multicultural polyglot uh, city it is now. And you <laughs> <Or very>, not. <laughs> well, it's, it's trying to return to the 70s, yeah. I think. Um, anyway, we won't go there. That might be uh, too nostalgic. Um, but, um, but there was always a sense where I was always regarded as an immigrant in school. You know, I was made to feel it. Um, you know, I felt it palpably, viscerally. And maybe that was a sort of, that's also why I'm quite, you know, I have my own issues, agenda for being slightly anti-nostalgia because I don't have much for that period. I have a sort of, a lot of my, my life has been determined in opposition to that sort of foundational experience and I, um, I went to live with my grandmother and my two aunts in Karachi after my parents divorced when I was six. And weirdly, you know, that was very instructive in some ways. It gave me a grounding in a different language structure, a different, a different condition of time. And I do think that the condition of time varies from place to place and, and can be culturally affected. You might confirm or deny that, but it's, it's my more subjective non-scientific belief well i mean your one's perception of time is altered by you know what you're doing um what you're feeling yeah. if you're you know fear arrests time you know you're you're frozen time time freezes but also what you what more is experiencing now is that you're you're remembering that right so maybe because I don't know, maybe your time in Pakistan, you had more fond memories of that time than, say, England. You will devote more time to those fond memories. So it's like they will maybe take on like a, a slower pace for you. Um, I guess, interestingly, they're not that fond either. Oh, OK, sorry. Because, <laughs> well, you know, I went from sort of feeling other to going to Pakistan and being made to feel other because Every so often I'd betray a sort of an English mannerism, accent. And so there was this, I mean, I think I definitely felt deeply, deeply, you know, uncomfortable till I was about 14 years old. And I don't know what switched, you know. Um, you but found the writings. 
I found Alexandra David yeah, Neal's writing and it was, it was all fine. <laughs> okay. um, um, I'd, I'd like to pretend that was the case, but I think well, it was probably from, you know, it made me a very uh, internalised uh, child and I, I definitely had a very rich imaginative life and was reading probably a lot more than, you know, my contemporaries and reading a lot wider to try and bridge those sort of, that sort of cultural schism of not feeling comfortable in one of a number of places. Um, but I think there was something at about the age of 14, and I remember it, it was like a conscious choice to kind of go, well, I can, I can either carry on with this sense of profound insecurity, but it probably won't work, um, work for me in life. And perhaps there's something, if I can flip this situation and my, my way of perceiving it, that there's something in there. You know, and I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's a fairly well-documented process, whether it's in, in therapy or some sort of uh, or other internal spiritual practices where, you know, you, you turn something to good account, to put it as simply as possible. And, you know, I started to realise that perhaps this disjointed existence that I felt allowed me to kind of be multiple. At that point, it was still fairly binary, but I thought I'm going to chase the multiple. And I sort of proceeded to kind of go and live in various countries and experience, try and experience various cultures from the inside because I felt somehow displaced enough to not be tied to, to anything I was leaving behind. And I think that became a very interesting conscious choice and a way I've made, been able to go through life that in a way, you know, and this maybe explains in a more profound way my more throwaway kind of comment about being sort of somewhat anti-nostalgia, but for me, Nostalgia was to be then rooted in either of these sort of set half cultures of origin of mine, neither of which I felt entirely comfortable with. So actually, for me, the movement away from nostalgia was, um, was a way to sort of progress beyond binary and to start to <coughs> really imagine the sort of multiple fragmented self rather than something that required, you know, inpatient treatment as, as, as a kind of as a sort of conscious threshold to kind of try and attempt to transcend. And it's something I've done both in my externalized practice of being an artist in the world, but something in my internal practice as well. And in a way, just sorry, and I'll, 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 I'll stop in a second. No, don't stop. But there was, there was something else you said that I thought was very relevant about that sort of, what did you say, about that sort of fragmentation. And I've, you know, I've, I found it sort of, um, oh, about keeping fresh, you know, what you said about adolescence, that it's all in flux. And I suppose what I've, I've sort of learned to do or tried to do over time is to purposely keep myself in flux. You know, so you keep something of that fresh naivety. You know, the very naivety that I felt so painfully aware of as a young man not fitting in actually became something I really tried to, to safeguard. And I, and I continue to try to safeguard, you know, that I can that I can still stumble, you know what I mean? That I don't need to know the answer, that I can take a new risk, um, that I can ask a new question. And you know, I think half of life or half the fun I have in life is, is being able to, to allow myself to walk into a room of, of experts um, in their field and ask dumb questions. I think it's been one of the most, you know, worthwhile. <laughs> and sum them up in a sentence. <laughs> well, I think you're being, you're being overly kind to me. But I mean, if you're, if you're talking about Reinducing naivety or reinducing uncertainty, the experience you <coughs> created certainly does that. Um, it's incredible to look down at yourself and and not see a, a body for starters. You're just like, okay, body is you know gone, and and you're it, there's no right or wrong. You're in this new territory. There are new rules that you're learning with with your body. Anything that's intuitive assumed about distance, depth, height, is, is out the window. And I was just wondering, okay, you were thinking about the narrative and, and the worlds you wanted to explore when you were designing this experience, but w were there any feelings or epiphanies that you wanted people to have? What, or what was your intention or motivation in, in, in designing it in, in terms of what you wanted people to experience? I think, you know, my intentions are generally on a couple of levels at once. 
So there was all the interest in the narrative and sharing something about these, these stories that for me sort of made this small town in the Indian Himalayas a sort of side theater of the Cold War as well as other esoteric and occult narratives, which my sort of conscious mind is fascinated by that sort of unpicking of the, and this is maybe where, and I, I, I sort of still hesitate to call it nostalgia, which maybe I need to go away and look at after this discussion, but you know, that I do find something very useful in unpicking the past in order to understand the present and what the possible futures that, that could sort of branch out in front of us are. Um, but I think with, with all my work, you know, and I've, I've um, over time, I think I'm able to sort of um, express this more freely. I think generally as an artist, you sort of don't want to be, you know, there's a, there's, I think, a, a sort of a reluctance to kind of out yourself as somebody with a kind of inner practice. And I think for me, it's something I've started to speak about more, more vocally. But in this experience, I was, I mean, I'd been experimenting with virtual technology for a number of years before I sort of published this, you know, put it out into the world. And, you know, I'd been sort of on the fence for a while about whether the technology was, would just fall into the trap of being a gimmick, um, you know, something like uh, holography in the 1970s, and whether it would, and, and might still suffer the same fate. Um, and I think what sort of got me off the fence finally was A, the technology had advanced, had advanced to where it, it could do some of the things I hoped to do with it. Um, but more importantly, I think I found with Kalimpong the right philosophical project to, to kind of, to question reality in the way that I really wanted to. Um, and where that, I mean, you know, I'm aware we, we have a limited time frame here, but you know, one of the things that really interested me in, quest in, in engaging with uh, digital and virtual technology was to question it. And to question it, not according to the sort of dominant mode of, of the day today, you know, where you know, there's, there's endless debates about whether the term virtual reality was coined in the 1950s or the 1970s. And I guess what I wanted to say was that actually it had been coined at least a thousand years ago in Tibet. Um, and, you know, esoteric Buddhism, which very much, you know, in the region around Kalimpong is the dominant um, thought form, you know, process, um, has been talking about reality being a hologram for at least a thousand years. And I'm interested in, in, you know, in the way in which we humans have sort of a thousand years later sort of just about sort of come up with the clunky technology to begin to kind of illustrate that in our sort of, clunk, you know, in our clunky kind of wonderfully human kind of way. And I think that was what really interested me. Could, could this technology somehow help me share some of the experiences I've been privileged to have? You know, I, I've, my restlessness that I talked about a minute before has pushed me to go off and have some experiences that, again, I've, I've only just started talking about in lectures and other things because, and even then I sort of keep them I gave a lecture at the, uh, the drawing room in London recently, and it, it was on the subject of uh, Tantra. And, uh, and I, I sort of talked about, talked v v in a very cursory way about a couple of experiences I have. I've, I happen to have been privileged enough to have had. And a, uh, and a young lady came up to me afterwards who was a yoga teacher and said, but why don't you talk about it all? You know, you'd have so many converts. And, and I was just like, you're illustrating my point. You, you know, it was very, you know. I know, I was thinking with the nostalgia, I was like, are we going to restrict the conversation to, to this lifetime? <laughs> I was like, oh, oh yes. Well, like, <laughs> there, is, there is that, you know. But I think as well, that's, an, you know, and I'm finding another reason why I'm sort of wary of nostalgia, because I remember um, a Sufi teacher of mine at one point, and, you know, I'd, in, my, in my sort of uh, training, I'd, I'd, I'd had an epiphany. I'd had, you know, I'd... I'd, I'd, I'd lost all sense of my body. I was, un I was the, the, that you know, union that's talked about in, in various sort of spiritual and occult treaties. I was it. I, there was, I dissolved and I became one with the universe. And I, I ran to tell my teacher. Um, and, and he just slapped me down with, well, don't get too hung up on it. <laughs> and, and of course, that's it. Because if you start to kind of make a fetish a nostalgic fetish of anything like that, it's, it's dead in the water. 
But I, I love the experience because I think, you know, at school, whatever, we're all used to these optical illusions. You know, you see, you, you, you see these optical illusions and then you, it's revealed to you how you construct the world around you and you're like, oh. And then, and then you get used to that. You even get used to the, the constructs. Mm. But then to be in this experience and to be constantly reminded, oh, humans, we're so stupid. You know, we're so stupid. I mean, we're doing the best we can, but to, 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 to again be reminded, oh, this is a construct, this is a construct, you know. Um, I'm not saying things don't exist, it's just the way we're perceiving them is, is not the, the way that they are, it's the way that we can perceive them. But having said that, your friend is now have, is coming back to me through this conversation, the friend that you were at the dinner with when we first met. I can oh. picture him now. Yes. I couldn't, I would never, he doesn't exist to me before you. So he's now coming back into the body. I can see, I can he, see. He dematerialised and he's now... Yeah, so yeah. You're... I remember him now, I remember him, I remember a lot. So I want you to um, talk about the finger and then maybe we can uh, ask the audience if they have some, some questions. Well, the finger's a very nice story. So th this goes back to Tom Slick, um, which is, is it's one of my favourite narratives, so it's very easy to get me to talk about it. Um, and if you want to know more about Tom Slick, they have in the bookshop my book on Kalimpong, where I actually wrote the essay that goes into Tom Slick myself, because I didn't, you know, didn't really trust anyone else to do it justice. But uh, I invited various other people to write on the other rabbit holes. So if any rabbit holes I've mentioned around Kalimpong are interesting, please go to the book. But... Tom Slick's Three Yeti Expeditions are fascinating because the personnel on his Yeti Expeditions overlaps with the personnel on Tenzing and Hillary's successful ascent of Everest and also overlaps with, with, um, with personnel involved in covert operations to supply Tibetan, Tibetan guerrillas in their, in their secret war against the Chinese occupiers. Um, in supposed CIA-funded ops. So, you know, you start to get a sense of, of what's, what's on offer here. And to make matters more interesting, you know, there's a lot of speculation um, about Tom Slick's CIA connections, um, including a, a, a kind of vast conspiracy that, theory that uh, the third and final Yeti expedition was actually the covert op uh, that provided the cover for the Dalai Lama's exfiltration from uh, Chinese-occupied Tibet into India. But that's not the best Yeti expedition. <laughs> the one Lee is referring to is number two, um, which is my personal favourite. Uh, Tom Slick had these two New Zealand brothers in his employ who were, you know, on the borderline between uh, adventurers and bounty hunters. And they cross over into Nepal to the Pangboche Monastery, which you can experience in my virtual reality. And so beautiful. It's, 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 you'd be, uh, you probably won't be surprised to hear that it's not very true to life. Uh, what is? Um, but um, um, the Pangboche Monastery historically held some of the best Yeti relics known to man. So the Pangboche Monastery had a scalp of a Yeti and the hand and forearm of a yeti. And obviously, how, we, how, we, how are we ever going to know? That's quite all right. I'll give you a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it provides a nice sort of build-up to my tale. So, <laughs> so these, two, these two brothers from New Zealand... Um, go over the mountain pass from India to Nepal and meet with the Lama of the Pangboche Monastery. And while one of them distracts the venerable Lama, the other one breaks off a piece of Yeti finger bone and replaces it with a chicken bone. <laughs> they then manage to get across the, back across the mountain pass into India, but are very worried about <laughs> smuggling it out of India. And who should happen to be in India? but the actor Jimmy Stewart, who's a great friend of Tom Slick and is there promoting a new film, along with his wife. And so the Yeti finger bone makes it to London in Mrs. Stewart's lingerie case. <laughs> this is one, I mean, this is where nostalgia gets good, so this is maybe where I, I, I kind of soften as well. And um, obviously the testing proves inconclusive, but, uh, so we still don't know to this day. But, it, you know, it's... Um, it's remarkable to think about times, other times and other places 
both in terms of acceptable norms of behavior and how they change and how they don't change. Um, I mean, I should say that that even led me to the sort of neon you, you encounter when you, yes, when you enter the space, that, you know, which, which was very unusual. I mean, you, I, I'm, I'm usually quite meticulous and I'd spent months designing a more, a more abstract, serene, zen landscape that I, I sort of, at the last minute, I thought, this is just not right. And I thought, this is what it needs at the moment. And obviously, this is a, a wrathful deity. It's actually the wrathful uh, deity form of Padmasambhava, who's, who's on the sixth floor. Uh, so there's some quite nice parallels going on in the museum across time and space, uh, to which I can only, you know, that's not to my credit, that's to the credit of some wonderful curators here who are obviously very engaged with their subjects and, uh, and, and, you know, and really sort of engaged with the work I was doing. But I think it's interesting how similar themes revisit you <coughs> during one, your lifetime. You know, me too, I was talking to Tim from too. They just come back in different it iterations again, uh, again. And, I, and what was interesting about the experience that you created was the way it ends is actually incredibly similar to how I spend most of my days. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but it, it, was, a, it was really a, a nice way to uh, end the journey. And so we might also end our combo here, I was thinking.